Hello, my name is Lisa Roger from Otimo, and I want to welcome you to the CIO podcast. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. We have a very, very, very special edition of Otimo CIO podcast. So you might see there's more people on here for once, and this is a good thing. We've got um, and I would like to raise your hand when I talk talk about you. Start off with the founder and CEO of Otimo, Raja Gudepu. Can you raise it there, Raja? Raja's going to help me host today. Um, so we're going to have a lot of fun because we have two CIOs from Federal Home Loan Bank Community, and they are they pl both play uh, key roles within the ecosystem. And we're going to explain more about what that means. But we have uh, Roger Nowakowski. Can you raise your hand, Roger? All right, and Brian Comp. Well done. All right, excellent. So, welcome, gentlemen. Um, let's get started. Awesome. All right. Uh, let me go ahead and first introduce uh, Roger Nowakowski uh, as CIO of Federal Home Loan Bank's Office of Finance since August 2011. Roger has direct responsibility for all development infrastructure and support of customer applications critical to the analysis, issuance, and servicing of all FHLB systems, $1 trillion debt portfolio. In addition to leading an ambitious multi-year business transformation initiative, Roger is responsible for the anticipation and migration, uh, mitigation of risks within the area of information technology. Prior to joining the FHLB Bank's Office of Finance, Roger served as the Vice President of Global Systems at Transaction Network Services, where he built and led an IT organization that consistently proved its value by achieving a set of clearly defined performance metrics. Uh, Roger has over 25 years of information technology experience, including the integration of several large-scale corporate mergers and acquisitions with a focus on systems architecture, development, and lifecycle implementation in production and back-office networks, including support implementation and security. Roger has an MBA from the University of Virginia, a diversity and inclusion professional certificate from Cornell University, as well as a Bachelor of Science in Computing Networking from Strayer University. He is also a certified information system security professional and a member of FSISAC and InfraGrad. And last but not least, Roger served with distinction in the United States Marine Corps for 10 years. Thank you for your service, Roger. I was impressed. Thank you. It's almost like I wrote that or something. <laughs> <laughs> You're a good friend. I know everything about you. I wrote that. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Brian Comp. Uh, Brian is the first vice president and chief information officer at FHLB Cincinnati. He has served in that role since 2020. And prior to that, he was the assistant CIO when he joined the bank back in 2016. As the CIO of FHLB Cincinnati, Brian is responsible for planning, developing, evaluating, aligning, and communicating the IT strategy, its initiatives, services, investment decisions, delivery structure, and processes to support the strategic direction and mission of the entire bank. Brian and his leadership team focus on continuous improvement of service delivery model at FHLB Cincinnati to further support the bank's overall mission. Previously, Brian worked in healthcare IT in a variety of leadership roles, including a public pharmacy services provider for a long-term care and not-for-profit healthcare organizations in Florida and Kentucky. Brian earned his BSBA from University of Louisville and an MBA from Bellarmine University in Louisville, Kentucky. So welcome, gentlemen. Um, hey, let's start off with you, uh, Roger. Can you tell us a little bit about FHLB's Office of Finance and its mission? Sure, absolutely. So let me start by you know just talking about the Federal Home Loan Bank system in general. It's comprised of uh, 11 regional banks, of which Brian is uh, at the Cincinnati Bank, and the Office of Finance, uh, which kind of sits uh, in a portion of the federal home loan bank system responsible for the capital markets function so the issue and servicing of debt for the system and just you know maybe to take a step back you know for most people don't know the federal home loan bank system it's about 90 plus years old that was originally uh, founded to provide liquidity um, to underpin the u.s financial services industry 
Um, so what we do as an organization is we provide uh, liquidity to commercial banks uh, in an effort to support both housing and community investment activities. And so from the Office of Finance's perspective, we support the 11 federal home loan banks. So we, we see ourselves as a service organization that is essentially the fiscal agent for the banks. And we receive requests from the banks as to the demands that are required to support their customers or commercial banks downstream. And we go to the market through issuance of discount notes and bonds in order to um, you know, essentially provide that liquidity back to um, the, the uh, individual better home loan banks. So that's that's what we do in a nutshell. It's um, it's it's, it's a pretty massive uh, undertaking on a daily basis, uh, where we are interacting both with the eleven banks as well as um, you know a, a selection probably at this point about seventy underwriters who interface with a much broader investor community uh, at a global reach. And so from a you know kind of a perspective of what we're issuing. We're issuing debt at the rate of about 25 to 35 billion dollars a day, or roughly seven trillion a year. That's impressive. Thanks, Roger. Uh, Brian, uh, can you tell us uh, a little about FHLB Cincinnati and its role in the FHLB ecosystem? Sure. As Roger mentioned, we are uh, one of 11 federal home loan banks, and being that we're uh, housed in Cincinnati. We cover the territory of Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee. So each of the 11 banks has a specific territory of members that they're responsible for. So the members that uh, that we have are either chartered in uh, Ohio, Kentucky, or Tennessee. Ohio is our largest market, but we also serve uh, a, a lot of members in Kentucky and Tennessee. Um, that being said, uh, our our goal, our mission at the bank is to serve our members who then can better serve the communities that they work in. So, for instance, and Roger mentioned the liquidity, our goal is to work with the Office of Finance and provide the liquidity to our members that they need to grow their businesses, to grow their communities through different types of uh, opportunities, but mainly focused on housing. Um, the other thing that I find very uh, intriguing about what we do a good portion or a, a, a portion of what the bank makes uh, on an annual basis is also given back to the communities through housing initiatives. So housing loans, uh, housing grants, and things that our, our members can also apply for on behalf of folks in their communities. And uh, pr we can, will provide those resources. So uh, a really great mission, probably one of the biggest reasons I joined the bank uh, I had never heard of the F FHLB system before I joined the bank. Uh, I, I was uh, interested in to hear what they had to do, but coming out of healthcare, I wasn't as uh, familiar with it. So um, and, it, it's and just a, a quick and just a quick follow up question there, Brian uh, and Roger. You can jump in here. Um, you know, we hear about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and as you're talking about providing liquidity for the housing market. How is FHLB different from the Fannies and Freddies of the world? Okay, yeah, so great question, Brian. You know, I think very similar to Fannie and Freddie, uh, we are a GSE. Uh, we are supported, you know, fundamentally by the U.S. government, but our role is somewhat dissimilar from Fannie and Freddie who warehouse mortgages. We are chartered with providing liquidity to commercial banks to support housing and community investments. And, yeah. and you know, not to um, kind of let Brian get away with this, <laughs> I want to underscore, you know, the, the, this notion of, of, you know, kind of um, affordable housing contributions. The 11 banks, if I'm not mistaken, were responsible or are responsible this year for providing roughly $1 billion towards affordable housing. Uh, so that's a pretty yeah. significant, um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of contribution to affordable housing on you know, kind of on a, on a macro perspective across the U.S. Yeah, and that's uh, Roger's right. That, that's done in a variety of ways, and some of those are our member banks will uh, put in an application uh, for a homeowner, uh, sometimes an individual homeowner, uh, mm -hmm. and it could also be uh, the down payment program. So, first-time home buyers can get. Uh, many of people have heard of the first-time home buyers program. 
And the bank is, uh, our bank sponsors that with a lot of our members. So it gives uh, first time home buyers the opportunity to perhaps get a house that they wouldn't be able to get if, if they weren't able to get those finances. We also help with uh, initiatives that might be apartment complexes in, in low, co low income areas. Uh, so it, it is a it is a broader mission than just uh, uh, making money uh, through the through the process. So that sounds like a fantastic mission. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Now we come to the part in our program, which everybody looks forward to. It's rapid fire. And I'd like a volunteer who would like to go first. Uh, I'll jump into my uh, Brian. Brian put his hand up first. Uh, Brian, I think Brian hand. I think Brian. I don't know. What do you think, Raja? If this were Jeopardy, I think Brian would win. Okay, all right. Let's, let's go with Brian. Okay, Brian. Here we go. I'm gonna both of you. The very last one. I'll let you explain it after both of you go through your your litany. But we will start with you, Brian. I'm gonna look over here on the list real quick. Bland or spicy? Spicy. Smooth or chunky? Chunky. Ford or Chevy? Toyota. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, I, I would have to say Ford. It's, uh, they've got, oh, uh, go ahead. Uh, can't, can't explain. Yep, got it. <laughs> Beetles or stones? Um, boy, I'd have to say Rolling Stones. <laughs> okay. Sunrise or sunset? Uh, sunrise. Mountain or ocean? Mountain. Fiction or nonfiction? Probably nonfiction for me. Shaken or stirred? Um, over ice, but uh, yeah, I, I, I'd say <laughs> shaken. You are struggling, Brian. Okay, here we go. Take out or dine in? Take out. Still or sparkling water? Sparkling. Star Trek or Star Wars? Star Trek. All right. Roger, I'm gonna shift to you now. Okay, I'm ready. Just a, li a little bit better. Palms are sweaty, better. but I'm ready. Oh, I, I, yeah, no expl no explanations. Okay, are we ready? <laughs> Unix or Windows? Windows. Country or rock? Country. Texting or calling? Texting. Chocolate or vanilla? Chocolate. Starsky or Hutch? Mm -hmm. Probably Starsky. Mac or PC? Mac. Dogs or cats? Neither. Pick one. You have to pick one. <laughs> Dogs. Early bird or night owl? Early bird. Samsung or iPhone? iPhone. Star Trek or Star Wars? Star Wars. Perfect. You both had different answers. Now, Ryan, why did you pick Trek over Wars? Um, probably because I recall in the late sixties, uh, William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy coming out with a series, uh, that was on Sunday mornings and I would get up just to make sure I saw the, all the episodes. So that, that's my memory. I probably didn't continue on with all the sagas that went on afterwards, but, uh, that's what I, that's my memory of Star Trek. I love it. I love it. All right, Roger. Why wars? Okay, so I'm not really a science fiction person. However, like Brian, I remember back to the 70s where Star Wars was the first movie that I was allowed to go to alone, my brother and I. And so I watched that. We snuck in the theater, probably watched it more times than we were allowed to. But it was, it was a great experience. Never watched any of the other ones after that, but it was a good memory. I love it. You both had like this nostalgic reason, which is perfect reasons for, for picking what you pick. So thank you for that. <laughs> that was great. I think I think both of you did really well. Um, yeah, All right. Uh, I don't I don't I don't think I can pick a winner uh, <laughs> from that from that performance. That was awesome. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's get into some of uh, some of our topics and talk technology and you know your your experiences and leadership. Um, so Brian, I'd like to start with you, what, you know, a generic question. Um, what do you think is the most important job of the CIO? Well, that's a great question. I think, uh, 
from my perspective, uh, having uh, a, a broad view of all the initiatives that an organization has to undertake to continue to support the business and the mission that they're uh, they're uh, trying to hold up. Um, and that broad view is everything from the business stakeholders, um, perhaps external stakeholders, regulators in our case, which we have a, a lot of regulatory oversight, um, internal staff, uh, our suppliers like Otimo, uh, all, all are important and we have to have relationships at every level to ensure we can we can fulfill the delivery mission that we have. That's really good. I love that broad view founded on relationships. Beautiful. Hey, Roger, what do you think? Do you agree or do you want to add, do you have a different perspective? Or? Totally agree. I, you know, I see the CIO as kind of a as a I don't know, I call it a diplomat I'm somebody who sits really between the technical aspects of things as well as the business. You know, he or she needs to understand the business, be able to communicate well effectively to business partners, to the board, so that they can understand the initiatives we're achieving or, or attempting to achieve, but also be um, have the ability to talk at a more granular tactical level with partners. Uh, with you know stakeholders within the organization, and even with the technical folks, to make sure they understand, you know, what they're doing, because the kind of manifestation of all of the work, you know, down to the administrator's level, into how that translates into business outcomes, I think is important for the whole chain. Thank you, Roger, for that. I I love that. You know, being that connectivity to everything, to, you know, every, from your team members to the rest of the organization, both excellent answers. Um, so I want to stick with you a little bit, uh, Roger, and ask you uh, uh, another question. And, and this one kind of goes with our theme of what we've been talking about this year with transformation. Um, but for you specifically, how do you ensure that the transformation efforts that you have underway deliver actual tangible business value to the organization? Yeah, so I've seen many initiatives where, you know, you call it business transformation, call it modernization, have failed because there isn't the proper alignment between, you know, technology and the business. So for us, when we embarked on our current business transformation effort, we made sure that we pulled in stakeholders. So, you know, Brian and, and the rest of the banks as well as internal stakeholders. And we outlined you know, pr three pretty simple business outcomes. So those business transformation initiatives are tied explicitly to these tenants, these three tenants. And for us, it's really being able to measure the success of our activities against those three goals. So you have three actual tenants? We Can do. We have they three, are? Sure. Um, one is, and probably our most uh, my primary focus is greater resiliency. So what are we building in terms of our technology platform that affords us greater resiliency from an availability standpoint, but also from business outcome perspective, right? So organizations, many organizations have a lot of manual processes that we are looking to automate those processes in an effort to not restrict the organization in terms of the outcomes, but to afford a higher degree of confidence around the delivery of those outcomes through both technology and business changes. So that's the first one is probably our principle when we're operating under. Faster time to market is another one. So how are we able to transform uh, the needs of the banks as well as uh, market changes into our platforms in order to deliver those transformational requests in a very rapid fashion. So, you know, think of that as more of modern engineering practices, agile value delivery, that sort of thing. And then finally, it's really focused around greater access to data. So how are our key stakeholders, both internal and external, the banks, investors, underwriters, our regulators, able to access data within our platforms in a safe and accurate manner? Uh, that's great. That's great, Roger. And I, I think the alignment of business and IT, you know, like you said, you know, if, if, if that is not in place, it doesn't matter how awesome the technology is, that's you right. know, it may, not, it may not work well. So, and the three tenants were, were great. And, and Brian, you know, do you, do you want to 
chime in and expand upon what what Raj just said. What's your perspective on that? Yeah, we have a very similar tenets uh, to the Office of Finance. Uh, sustainability is what we call our, uh, probably the more first one, but it's more of a resiliency, sustainability. How can we build systems to support our business areas that can be maintained and live on uh, for, for a longer period of time and, and make us more uh, uh, resilient to anything that comes our way? Uh, the other thing in our modernization journey that, that we're experiencing is, uh, as Roger mentioned, you have to get the, the stakeholders involved. Um, they, we have to be at least uh, in alignment at the top level. There's a lot of things that change through the agile processes, and, and we all recognize that. But um, at the top level, we're all working towards the same goals. Uh, and then the other thing Roger mentioned, and we we. We also are looking at uh, data and data analysis and how can we use that and leverage that data to better support our mission. Uh, I'll add one more for, from our perspective, and I think Roger touched on the safety uh, I- issue, but we call it safety and soundness at, at our bank. And I think, uh, you know, we want to make sure that our systems are secure and are capable of um, you know, continuing business in, in when there's disruptions out out in the world, uh, like we've seen, you know, over this past couple of years. That's fantastic. So, just pulling along 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 that thread, um, Roger, I'll I'll let you go first. Uh, I know both, you know, both of you have led various technology transformations in the past. You're, you're, you're currently in the middle of some of those. Uh, but but starting with Roger, what was the most interesting lesson that you or your team learned from doing transformation initiatives? Boy, you know, I think we had the pleasure and privilege of being able to reach out to our our banks, our 11 banks, who are all in various stages of their own business transformations and get some you know kind of real candid feedback from them in terms of, what they did really well and what they wish they had changed in the process. So for us, we were able to, you know, from our partners out there, you know, who we work very closely with, identify potential pitfalls and remediate those early in the process. So one of those for us was really taking a foundational approach to this business transformation and giving ourselves the latitude of time to prepare the organization both from a training and from just a process standpoint of how we are going to be successful in achieving those goals. So, you know, it, that, that manifests itself in, you know, spending pretty much a year uh, bringing in new technologies around, you know, kind of microservices, around uh, CICD pipelines, you know, partnering with Otimo to bring in, you know, expertise around that area to kind of backfill or backstop our technical knowledge as well as building frameworks and understanding and ceremonies around Agile. We went from waterfall to Agile. It took us the better part of about a year, year and a half, but it was important for us to bring in partners to help understand what are some of those challenges. And for our benefit, we were able to make that transformation across the organization. It wasn't just an IT initiative because we were able to go back to the foundational tenets of modernization and business transformation. And it was important for us to make sure that our partners on the business side also made those transformations with us. That's great. How about you, Brian? What is it, do you have a big lesson learned from a transformation project that you want to share with everybody? Sure. Well, uh, from my perspective, uh, and Roger was kind of hitting on this, it, it, it's a journey. And, you know, it, there's a lot of things that need to line up as time goes on. And sometimes the processes are, are ahead of the people or um, mm-hmm. the technology is behind. And so it, it is really trying to figure out where am I at currently on these, these initiatives from a people process and technology perspective. But then how do I go close the gap between where I want to go with the modernization initiative. So we've learned a lot um, and we continue to learn. We do recognize that we couldn't do this without partners. Um, Roger was kind enough uh, a couple years ago to introduce me to Otimo. Um, you know, good partners help us on that journey. 
Uh, I also would uh, suggest we couldn't do it without our internal staff. Some of them have come along faster than others. There, you know, we uh, the federal home loan bank system retains its employees for long periods of time. So some of the some of our staff haven't seen modernization initiatives or perhaps don't know a lot about the new technologies, and it scares them a little bit. So there's a lot of hand holding, uh, training, uh, getting them uh, comfortable. And then, you know, I would contend the one area that is probably further ahead or the, at least the desire for modernization is the business areas. They they know what's out there, right? I, I kind of blame uh, Apple a little bit because of the, you know, the iPad, the, uh, the technologies that they brought to the market has really shown the business owners what what's capable, what we can do. And we learned, you know, that that we have to be have our ear to the ground, understand what the business is looking for, engage perhaps outside uh, experts to have more knowledge and, and better understanding of how to um, join us on this journey and help us uh, get through it. So I think that's been my biggest lesson, particularly at the federal home loan bank system. But I, I would also contend healthcare is not dramatically different. They, they retain their staff for a long time. And, you know, that, that often, uh, is is one of the cultural things that you have to work through knowing brian well um you know i, I think that he is very, very intentional about people processes and technology i know we are technology comes after people and processes I, I don't think that you can you know kind of change the order of that and have the same success yeah that's beautiful Absolutely. you both are right I, and I love like how you started off, Roger, with, you know, you have to take the time around training and processes and just what you said, those two first before technology. And then and then Brian, I love how you have that lens of you got to have visibility uh, on all of these things and they have to be balanced because they are often not at the same place at the same time. That's not normal. So um, great insights from both of you. And, and Brian, I want to pull a thread a little bit into and shift the conversation a little bit, but you ended with kind of some future thinking. So we would love to know for both of you, but we'll start with you, Brian, you know, when you're thinking about, you know, where the world is heading and, and what we're faced with, and you talked about having to keep up with our, you know, they're reading stuff on their iPads or, disruptions happening all around you, you know, from a technology perspective, like what worries you maybe, or what excites you uh, about the future? I'd love to know your thoughts on, you know, where, where's the world heading? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and it does excite me, you know, there, we're, there's always a certain amount of nervousness when you, when you look at what's, what's on the forefront and, and how things are changing so rapidly. Um, but you know we're doing things I think to prepare the bank uh, uh, for that future, uh, and I'll just give you a good example: uh, the, the journey to the cloud. Uh, we've been a very insular organization. We've had on-premise data centers uh, going back, you know, since the existence of uh, the IT department. Um, but having cloud come into our organization and recognizing that some of the things that are offered in cloud outweigh the risk of the cloud. And and those are uh, what's going to keep us, at least in my opinion, um, perhaps ahead or continuing to be able to change more rapidly because those that, that change can happen in the cloud faster than it can uh, internally. So uh, it, and that's, that's a big thing for us is how can we prepare the organization to be more elastic, more more adaptable and resilient. And the cloud is enabling a lot of that. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and Roger, what your, your perspectives on, on the future? You know, it's just interesting to see how fast things are changing. You know, I think from a, a local perspective, it's really kind of allowing the business units to have the tools. You know, as Brian mentioned, there's a commoditization of technology. So they understand how powerful it is. So kind of the notion around citizen developers and what tools can we give them while still maintaining the controls over sustainability of development and tools that we're using to make business decisions. So I think that's, that's rapidly growing um, data 
uh, how much is out there and how useful it can be, but also how dangerous it can be if we don't have controls over the quality of the data. And I think more on a global scale is looking at how financial services is just changing so rapidly. You know, gone are the days of, you know, kind of ACH clearing and we're down to, you know, thinking about crypto and the immediacy of the transfer of funds without financial institutions. Uh, you know, central bank, you know, digital currency is, you know, kind of, it's a, it's a forethought across a lot of countries in terms of how they're going to adopt that and how that is going to be a pretty radical transformation to current banking models. So how does that all incorporate in, you know, kind of into the, the function that we provide from a liquidity standpoint to the banking sector? Uh, that's fantastic. So yeah, I think the, the shifts are, based on what you said, are not just happening on the technology front with you know, AI and, you know, and machine learning coming you know, into into the forefront, but also the business shift with different models, right? Not just money as we know in dollars, but crypto and digital currencies and such. That's mm -hmm. pretty interesting. Um, thanks for thanks for those uh, those insights, uh, Brian and Roger. So, you know, we'd like to end our conversation now with some inspiration for the future IT leaders. Um, so Roger, we'll start with you first. If you were to meet your younger self in a bookstore or a coffee shop, or even better at a bar, uh, what advice would you give yourself? So I'm gonna key off of what Brian said, it's all about relationships. So whether it's relationships with, you know, folks around you within your organization, whether it's building partnerships and relationships with folks like Atimo who can, you know, kind of helps accelerate and give the success that organizations are looking for. I think that's critical. Right? You know, I think building a uh, network of folks that you can rely on and that relate those relationships are critically important. So I think that's that's one element of it. And then I think surrounding yourself with really, really good people, uh, you know, and shining the light on them. I think that is really important. I think a lot of people are kind of intimidated by you know, bringing in folks who, you know, they appear or could be at their same level and fear that that they're going to overtake them. I think a good leader is somebody who can bring in high quality, talented people and they share the success. That's, right, that's, uh, yeah, those, those are, that, I think that's a, that's a great insight. Just just, you know, uh, I think what you what you said about hiring people or finding people that are in a way better than you. So, you know, and, and you don't necessarily have to be the smartest person in the room is basically what you're saying. You need you need different perspectives. Um, and probably in the earlier years, people tend to not see that, right? Because- Right. My dad used to always say that, you know, a successful career is somebody who works himself out of a job. True, that's well said. <laughs> what about you, Brian? Coffee shop? Well, what would you say to yourself? Well, it's probably more likely a bar, but uh, that that being <laughs> said, I, I think uh, uh, Roger hit the nail on the head with the people. You know, you you, you don't uh, you don't get ahead in this this world if you don't make those relationships and you don't bring the best people along. Um, there's also times though when you when you have folks you have to say goodbye to, whether that's in a um, a friendly manner and watch them go off and build their career somewhere else or or sometimes not in a friendly manner but you have to know when to draw that line and and be kind and patient with people um i had a i had a boss 40 plus years ago that uh, one time told me if, if you have an employee that's not successful you own some of that and i've always taken that to heart that you know, you have to do everything you can to make that employee as successful as, as possible. And sometimes that means they, they, they leave an organization. But we have, uh, you know, we, we have to build good teams that uh, can support us. And we have, uh, you know, the opportunity as leaders to do that. Those are both great answers. Very inspirational. <clears throat> and uh, Raja and I just want to thank you so much. Uh, for your time today and sharing your wisdom. Um, and we've learned so much, not only about your leadership styles and what's going on in your organizations, but 
about FHLB, the community itself and its mission. Just want to thank you. And um, Raja, do you want to say a few words? Yeah, no, uh, it's been it's been a great conversation. Again, I know you both as great IT leaders and more importantly, you both are genuine, authentic, you know, people, um, you know, and, and thank you for everything you guys do. Uh, and thank you for taking the time and, uh, you know, coming on to the show today because I know how busy you guys are. So I really appreciate you know, you're taking some time. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it's been a great opportunity. And, you know, I, I thank Roger for uh, introducing us to you guys. So I think that uh, that is helping us quite a bit with our modernization journey. And uh, Lisa, I, I must commend you. You said Louisville, just like you were from Kentucky. So you did good. <laughs> you did good. Thank you. Did thank you. Drink some bourbon this morning. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. A little liquid encouragement. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. All right. Have a great day.